I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Andrew Carnegie and his Pittsburgh-based steel corporation. Just to ensure that there's no confusion over this being some sort of open love letter to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Eagles, baby! So speaking of booming society and technological advances, we've got a sink in the oral history lab, guys. Come on, that's pretty awesome. Andrew Carnegie, what a guy! The man started off with literally almost nothing as a young Scottish immigrant who came to the United States because his father's business failed back in Scotland due to booming technology and advancements in society. In 1848, Carnegie's family immigrated to Pennsylvania where a young Andrew Carnegie got a job at a local textile factory as a bobbin boy. For those of you who have yet to fill out your first ever job application, a bobbin boy provides a promising future in the textile industry. All you have to do is deliver bobbins. This is where you should be pulling out your home ec background knowledge. So the women working the looms whenever they ask for a new one. Sometimes when they need tiny hands to fit into places that adults can't get to, they'll call upon a bobbin boy to fix the machines. It only led to a few finger losses every once in a while. But that's a story for another day. We're not worried about that right now. Right now, we're worried about that young boy named Andrew Carnegie, who took advantage of the opportunities that America had to offer, and somehow grew up to become the richest man that the United States had ever seen. Truly living out the American dream, Andrew Carnegie took advantage of every opportunity that having a job as a bobbin boy afforded him. A local citizen wanting to help out all of the working children had opened up his personal library to the kids who worked in the factories nearby. Carnegie took advantage of this and through the books there in that personal library, he gained an education that helped him move from bobbin boy to Western Union messenger all the way up to the ranks of the superintendent for the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And you guys ask why you have to go to school? It was through this job with the railroad company that Andrew Carnegie started to see the advancements in technology and how they could eventually help him to gain a massive fortune. Have I mentioned that yet? That Andrew Carnegie was really, really rich? By 1865, right when railroads started to become really popular in the United States, Andrew Carnegie opened up his first of many businesses, the Keystone Bridge Company. Just a few short years later, in 1873, he opened his first steelworks company, the first major step to what would turn into the largest fortune in America during his time. Andrew Carnegie was really rich. Really, really rich. I don't think you guys understand this. The man was rich. With the quickly expanding cities and buildup of skyscrapers in the United States, the growing railroad lines moving across the country, and the booming automobile industry, steel became a major staple in American society. Located in Pittsburgh, hey, hey, Steelers! Carnegie Steel Corporation quickly rose to success through his push to drive down the cost of operation and undersell his competition. He was able to drive down his prices in part because of a business tactic called vertical integration. In vertical integration, an owner of a company will buy all of the small businesses that it takes in order to produce that one major product in his industry. Let's take a look at this through an easy to follow example. The meat packing industry. So we're gonna go ahead and take a trip out to Chicago right now because that is the heart of the meat packing industry. Unfortunately, meat packing begins with these adorable little cows right here. The owner of a meat packing plant, let's call him Jorgis Rudkus might purchase these cows in the farm that they come from to take out that middleman that would have to be paid extra. Then, Jorgis might purchase a slaughterhouse and hire the meat packers himself to once again drive down the costs of the middleman. That meat then needs to be transported to the East Coast. So Mr. Rudkus would purchase a refrigerated train car that is then taken to a cold warehouse that he also owns, where the meat is stored before bringing it to a meat packing plant owned by you guessed it, Jorgis Rudkiss. From there, the meat is packaged and Jorgis Rudkiss is responsible for then sending it out to local grocers and earning an insane amount of money. All for profit because he doesn't have to pay any middlemen along the way. He owns every single step in the process. 
Obviously, Carnegie wasn't worried about purchasing cows, but he did make it his goal to control a lot more than just his steel corporation. He also wanted control over the iron ore barges, coal and iron fields, and railroads that would be responsible for delivering the natural ores to him before they could be converted to steel. Vertical integration proved so successful for Carnegie, with the exception of the railroad part. He never really did gain control over the railroads. That he easily outsold his competition and became a dominant force in the steel industry. In fact, he was such a dominant force that by the time he sold his steel corporation in 1901 to famous banker J.P. Morgan, it was worth almost $500 million and producing more steel than all of Great Britain combined, making Andrew Carnegie the richest man in America. Have I told you guys about that yet? Despite the fact that Carnegie was known in a number of circles as a ruthless businessman, he did actually feel as though it was his duty as the richest man in America to share his wealth with those who were less fortunate. Carnegie is what we would call a philanthropist. A philanthropist is a person who donates his money to different charities to help improve society. One of his biggest focuses was on building up public libraries so poor children would have the same opportunities for an education that he was given as a young bobbin boy. By the time he died, Andrew Carnegie had given away approximately $350 million to charities all throughout the United States, hoping that he could help some other young person go from rags to riches. Talk about the American dream, guys! I keep wanting to say that Andrew Carnegie dated $350 million. I mean, the man loved his money, but I don't think he really loved it that much.